All right. There you go. Perfect. Waiting for that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for coming in this morning. And uh, just, just as a heads up, so the next three weeks are kind of very special for Grand Rounds because they're all fellow led Grand Rounds and uh, especially third years. And uh, although we've already had one uh, talk from Alex before, uh, I, you know, I just want to take this opportunity to just say congratulations on the young fellows who are completing three years of probably one of the toughest general cardiology periods in training. All of you started in uh, July 2020 with me. So it's a special, I can totally understand how challenging this, uh, this period has been, especially uh, in building community and then still sort of doing the, uh, you know, activities that sort of build and define our fellowship program. Uh, and I, I think uh, we, uh, we will have uh, two presenters today. Uh, you know, the email said it was gonna be one, but, and all the uh, things that follow over the next two weeks are also third year talks rather than debates. So as a clarification to the email that went out this morning, uh, we're going to start off with Dr. Kidong Wang. Kidong received his medical degree from Albert Einstein College of Medicine um, and completed his residency at Dartmouth before joining us for fellowship training here. He's been an exceptional fellow here and uh, is poised to become an even more exceptional interventional cardiologist uh, starting his fellowship this July. And uh, he's going to talk to us about Euro-PCR highlights as, uh, as it relates to science that has emerged at the major conference in, uh, in European uh, interventional cardiology. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, so before I begin, um, I just want to thank my co-presenter, uh, Karina. Um, she, not a lot of people know, but she was actually my uh, first year resident when I was a sub by Albert Einstein. So, you know, she kind of taught me the ropes of medicine when I first started in, uh, in clerkship years. So it's kind of come in full circle. So it's always a pleasure to uh, work with Karina. So welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. There you go. Okay. Um, so today I'll be presenting my portion of the talk. It'll be on the Euro PCR trial that was uh, that happened in May. Um, so I'm going to choose three studies to focus on. Um, each study will be on a specific area of interventional cardiology that, to me, are uh, some you know that may be practice changing for many of us. So the first study is a coronary trial. Uh, this is the European Bifurcation Club five-year outcome study uh, presented at the EuroPCR, and it's entitled Stepwise Provisional versus Systemic Coulette for Stenting of True Coronary Bifurcation Lesion. Uh, and it's a five-year follow-up of the multi-center randomized EBC2 trial. And the reason for the two is because uh, 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 it's either, uh, it looks at provisional or two-stent strategy. So this will become clear in my next slide. Um, so coronary bifurcation accounts for approximately 20% of PCI, uh, but their treatment remains challenging with lower procedural success rate. Um, the optimal treatment for bifurcation disease continues to be debated. Um, so there are two broad categories of uh, approach for bifurcation diseases. One is an upfront two-step strategy, and then the other one is a provisional strategy, whereby the main vessel is stented, um, and then you only stent the side branch if, uh, if needed. Um, so early randomized trials comparing provisional versus uh, two-step strategy showed no significant cardiovascular benefits. Um, and then in terms of bifurcation, I think some of the most basic stuff is that uh, the most widely used classification scheme um, is the Medina classification. Um, this classification assesses plaque burden based on the presence or one or absence uh, denoted by zero of stenosis in the proximal main branch, distal main branch, and the side branch. So a true bifurcation lesion has to involve both the main branch, whether proximal or distal disease, and the side branch. So it's uh, highlighted in the circles. Uh, in terms of background for the study, uh, what do we know so far? So the uh, EBC trial was actually published uh, in one year follow-up back in 2016. This was a one year, 12 month follow-up study. And it looked at, you know, like I mentioned, stepwise provisional strategy versus upfront two stent coulette strategy. And the authors found that there were no statistical difference between provisional strategy and systemic two stent coulette strategy in terms of MACE after 12 months. So this led to a uh, recent uh, European Bifurcation Club, co club consensus that generally two stent strategy should be reserved for 
sort of complex anatomy and uh, dependent on operator experience. Uh, and one stent strategy is usually recommended for the vast majority of bifurcated lesions and even in complex bifurcations as well. So the trial design, uh, so it's a five-year outcome study. The trial was international, multi-center, parallel group, uh, randomized trial in six European countries. Um, so 200 patients uh, that were 18 years or older with non-left main bifurcation disease were randomized into either the provisional group or the upfront two-stand cruelest strategy. Of note, everybody needed to have a true bifurcation. Um, all limbs of the bifurcation had to be greater than 2.5 millimeters in diameter, and the side branch osteal disease needed to be at least 5 millimeters in length. Um, so within the provisional group, further side branch stenting was indicated if the TIMI flow was less than three after stenting the uh, main branch, uh, or there would, uh, would be 90% osteal side branch stenosis after stenting of the main branch, or there'd be threatened uh, side branch closure or side branch dissection. Uh, the main cri exclusion criteria were left main narrowing, acute MI, cardiogenic shock, uh, CTO of either branches, um, and additional type C lesion requiring PCI, as well as ejection fraction lower than 20% or platelet count of less than 50 and life expectancy less than a year. Um, in terms of follow-up, uh, so 197 patients completed a follow five-year follow-up study. Uh, side branch was required in, side branch stenting was required in 16% of the provisional group. Routine angiography, and this is critical, I think, routine angiography was not performed unless clinically indicated. And uh, the analysis was performed on an intention to treat basis. Uh, so the uh, primary endpoints of the study was a composite of all-cause mortality, myocardial infarction, or target vessel revascularization at five years. The secondary endpoints are the individual components of the primary endpoint, as well as stent thrombosis. Um, and then the author further looked at the side branch disease length um, and did a separate analysis, um, uh, which we'll talk about. So in terms of baseline characteristic, uh, the mean age was uh, 60 years old. Um, so 16 to 21% were female and equal percentage of patients had either prior MI or PCI. Both group has similar LV ejection fraction and non-STEMI, non-ST elevation MI ACS was well represented in both groups. Uh, in terms of procedural characteristic on the uh, right side, the mean side branch lesion length was 10.2 millimeters. Uh, side branch stenting, as we mentioned, was required in 16% of the provisional cohort. The rates of final kissing balloon was pretty high in both groups, 95%, and the procedural success rate was greater than 97%. So of note, um, significantly more patients in the Kulek group actually underwent additional PCI for bystander disease, um, and that may affect our base outcome. And also, as expected, uh, the procedural uh, cost of the provisional stenting group uh, was less, and there was also, in general, less radiation in the provisional group compared to the uh, uh, two-stent strategy group. So here's the results. Um, after five years of follow-up, the cumulative five-year incidence of composite primary endpoints of MACE was not statistically different between the two groups, uh, with 18.4% uh, of MACE occurring in the provisional group and 23.7% of MACE occurring in the upfront two-stent strategy group. So when looking at the individual components of MACE, uh, there is no significant difference either between the two groups. Um, All-cause mortality occurred in 7.5% of study population, of which 3% were from cardiac mortality. Um, paraprocedural MI occurred at slightly numerically higher rate in this two-stent group compared to the provisional group. Um, but there was no statistical significant uh, difference. And target lesion revascularization also occurred in similar uh, rates between the two groups. Um, so we mentioned about the kind of the length of the side branch. Um, and the reason why this is important is because it's thought that longer and larger side branch um, is felt to be more functional, functionally significant since it subtends a larger myocardial territory. Um, so this chart shows that the author broke down um, the groups in terms of side branch disease that's less than one centimeter or greater than one centimeter. 
And um, the authors found that the pre presence of a longer side branch um, did not necessarily confer any uh, uh, statistic difference in terms of strategies between the two groups. So in conclusion, this study uh, provides the longest follow-up of patients undergoing either provisional versus coulette bifurcation PCI. It shows that upfront two-stand strategy does not offer additional long-term benefit beyond provisional strategy in non-left main bifurcation disease, regardless of the side branch length. Um, in general, the author concluded that a relatively low 16% rate of conversion from provisional to side branch stenting suggests that the majority of upfront side branch stenting may not be necessary. Um, and of note, uh, while our talk focuses on now left main bifurcation lesion, the European bifurcation group has also done studies on the you know on left main bifurcation and found no significant difference in their three-year follow-up. Um, so some considerations for this study. Um, so you know this study kind of focuses on coulette two-step strategy. Um, but there are studies uh, out there that have shown that uh, the DK crush technique uh, which we won't go into much detail here, um, uh, but I can talk about it later, reduces kind of uh, target lesion failure compared with provisional strategy. Uh, and those are uh, typically done in complex bifurcations. Um, of note, uh, there is some difference between uh, this trial and other trials, such as the definition two trial, and that this one has no routine angiographic follow-up. Uh, and the uh, decisions were left to their discretion in terms of uh, whether or not uh, to send patients for repeat angiography. And then lastly, you know, intravascular imaging, um, which wasn't really focused in this study, um, uh, are, are now really an important component of bifurcation stenting strategy. So uh, this is the first trial. So moving on to the next one. Um, yeah. So I think during the index uh, PCI, if there was any jailing, uh, and they mentioned if there was greater than 90% stenosis of the side branch, then they would proceed with uh, stenting of the side branch. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, in the provisional group. So uh, moving on to the next study, we have a structural trial. Um, so this is the chimney stenting versus basilica for prevention of acute coronary obstruction during TAVR, uh, and this was presented by Dr. Mangieri um, at the EuroPCR. Um, so uh, in terms of background, um, so coronary obstruction is in general very rare, uh, uh, but it's really a devastating complication of TAVR. So it occurs in fortunately less than 1% of patients, um, but it is associated with mortality of up to 50% even in spite of attempted rescue with PCI or cabbage. Um, so therefore upfront kind of decision-making in terms of whether or not there needs to be coronary pr protection is really important. Um, so, the, so the incidence is higher in certain subgroups. Uh, so people who have valve and valve TAVR uh, tend, to be, tend to have higher incidence of coronary obstruction, those with low coronary heights and those with shallow uh, sinotubular junctions. There are other risk factors as well. Um, so the two strategies which are commonly undertaken uh, to prevent coronary obstruction are chimney uh, procedure, aka snorkeling, and I'll show you a picture next and you'll see why it's called snorkeling, uh, and the basilica techniques. So this is a video, um, not sure if there will be audios in it. You're using not two six French catheters through the um, femoral artery, we take them either side of the aortic valve. And then we take a guide wire and electrify it and poke that through the base of the left coronary scallop in this case and uh, snare that in the LVOT. We tighten that guide wire loop so only about two millimeters of guide wire is exposed when we electrify again and pull both catheters upwards, lacerating that valve in the center. Uh, we align that up to the coronary artery fluoroscopically and by echo and then implant uh, the valve in which should splay those leaflets either side, um, allowing blood to flow in. And on the left, you see that coronary artery is positioned in the same place uh, anatomically, but with a picture using two six French catheters. So the audio is a little bit kind of small, but basically they use two catheters and lacerate with electrified guide, guide wire 
through the leaflet uh, that uh, they felt uh, would compromise the uh, osseum of, the, of either side of the coronary arteries. And so the laceration can occur either on one side or they can choose to do it on both sides of the, of the osteum. So that's the basilica technique. Um, so the chimney technique um, is rather uh, conceptually simple. Um, it's basically parking an undeployed stent in the coronary artery that's deemed at high risk for obstruction. If there's evidence of coronary obstruction after initial TAVR deployment, then the coronary stent is deployed, uh, extending from the osteum into the aorta. So that's kind of why it looks like, kind of like a chimney. So, uh, so, so far there has only been case reports and observational studies for the two techniques. Um, the chimney technique overall is less technically demanding than basilica. Um, but the cons are that the stent is protruding out into the aorta and it may pose a risk for thrombosis or restenosis. Um, there's no available data in general about the intensity or duration of the antiplatelet therapy, uh, and the stents may compromise future access to coronary artery. Uh, the basilica is a newer technique. Uh, there is one kind of small study, a prospective single arm study of 30 patients uh, who are at high risk for coronary obstruction. And the basilica was, you know, overall pretty successful in those patients. Um, with no cases of coronary obstruction or need for re-intervention re after 30 days. Of note, uh, for people who do get basilica, they're kind of theoretically at risk for uh, debris embolization. So in a large majority of cases, cerebral protection was provided. Uh, and, you know, because this is a pretty technically demanding um, technique, uh, it's not really widely available outside of expert centers. So, you know, here we come to this trial now, um, which is comparing the outcomes of the two procedures. Um, so it's a retrospective analysis, uh, including TAVR patients who are treated at dedicated centers that perform either chimney stenting or basilica stenting. Um, data was collected from 2015 to 2022 all over Europe and from one American center, and I believe that was Montefiore. Um, centers were selected according to their capability to perform either one of those two procedures. Um, so 71 consecutive patients were recruited in the uh, chimney hospital, hospitals, and within the Basilica group, there were 97 patients. The primary endpoint was one year MACE. The secondary endpoint was individual components of the primary endpoint of MACE, as well as paraprocedural complications and uh, uh, kind of bailout stenting or technical success. Um, so the selected baseline demographic, this is not everything, but I chose uh, these, um, uh, were pretty comparable between the two groups. Um, in general, the Basilica group did have more patients with chronic kidney disease than the chimney group, which kind of makes sense because in chimney group, you would be using more contrast for the, the stents. Um, patients in the chimney group have more uh, moderate, uh, severe MR at baseline and slightly lower BMI, but not a huge amount. Um, in terms of the pre-TAVR CT scan, the Basilica group was at higher risk for obstruction in general because uh, they had more challenging anatomy around the valve, such as a, you know, a lower sinotubular junction height uh, and sinotubular diameter. Procedure characteristics. Um, so uh, in the chimney population, 45% require upfront double stent of, the, of both osseous. 38% require left main stenting and 17% 70 require osteo-RCA stenting. In the basilica group, 85%, which is actually quite a large amount of patients require dual leaflet laceration. Um, so overall, the authors conclude that the high percentage of patients requiring protection of both osteo indicates that you know, these techniques are in general pretty evolved and demanding. Um, uh, on the chart to your right, uh, in general, the basilica group, we observe a similar procedural length, uh, despite concern that the basilica may be more technically challenging of the two. Uh, in the chimney group, there was more contrast use as expected, and thus more incidence of AKI. Um, and then in the basilica group, group 89% of cases involved the use of cerebral protection device. So quite, quite a large majority. Um, so here's the result. The overall primary endpoint of MACE incident was similar between the two, uh, the two, the two groups. Um, but you know, it just doesn't really doesn't just end there. You know, I think this is also probably even a more important slide 
Um, so, you know, in terms of these individual secondary endpoints, um, there were in general more minor bleeding, paravalvular leak, pacemaker and pacemaker requirement uh, in the chimney cohort compared to the basilica group. Um, and then the authors also look at freedom from bailout uh, coronary stem. So, you know, in the chimney group, um, the bailout is really the stents themselves. So, you know, it's really hard to kind of define bailout in this group. But, you know, one coronary obstruction did occur due to stent loss. Um, in the basilica group, the operator proceeded with bailout stenting in eight of those cases. Um, so three of those cases were due to leaflet prolapse, one due to osteohematoma, and the remaining were due to operator kind of um, uh, being unsatisfactory with the way the uh, leaflets are split. So in conclusion, the authors uh, uh, say that the two techniques appear to be quite comparable in terms of primary endpoint MACE. Um, procedural success rate were similar in both groups, although in 8% of the Basilica group, patients did get bailouts. Uh, and 8% is really, in my opinion, not a negligible amount. Um, there were also more paraprocedural complications in the chimney group. Um, so obviously, randomized study, perspective study is needed to compare and contrast uh, between the two techniques. Um, but this might be a really kind of a challenging uh, uh, thing because, you know, we are limited to centers with high level of expertise. And lastly, hopefully in the future, there are more standardized techniques for the Basilica pr uh, procedure, which uh, seems to be more favored uh, in kind of the current uh, uh, Tiber world compared to chimney. Uh, so my uh, uh, last study, um, so, uh, you know, this is kind of a slight veer from the uh, uh, EuroPCR. Uh, this wasn't really exactly presented at EuroPCR, but it was published in the Euro Interventional Journal uh, at around the same time as this conference. Uh, and the reason why I'm presenting it is because, you know, I think it will be impactful in our practice uh, down the line uh, for most of us. Um, so this is titled the single antiplatelet therapy directly after percutaneous intervention in non-ST elevation ACS patients. And it's called the Optica study uh, by Dr. Van der Sangen. So, you know, one of the reasons why I brought uh, kind of this study up is, you know, many of you recall that um, my co-fellow Alex Thomas and I, we gave a grand rounds presentation about two years ago on the optimal duration of DAP therapy um, after PCI. Um, so, you know, this chart shows that, you know, it is invariably true that the longer we keep patients on DAP, the higher the chance of significant bleeding event. Um, however, optimal DAP duration is not necessarily black and white as demonstrated by this kind of scale that balances thrombosis versus bleeding risk. Um, and in general, you know, I think um, at least, you know, the way I kind of treat patients is that usually we kind of consider them kind of on a case by case basis uh, in the clinical world. So, you know, we take into account several patient factors. Um, so um, there are tools and scoring schemes uh, that you guys might have remembered that we talked about um, during that grand rounds. Um, and those, you know, scoring schemes do help us gauge ischemic versus bleeding risk. Um, but, you know, there are scoring schemes and, you know, they often really kind of lack the, you know, required granularity that we kind of demand from this very personalized decision on DAP duration. Um, so here are some of the kind of trials um, that have been pretty impactful so far on um, kind of advocating for shorter DAP duration. Um, I think what is clear is that for the large majority of the population, uh, just by the virtue of the slew of the short DAP trial over these years is that DAP can be shortened in duration, um, sometimes to a significant degree, even in higher risk ACS group. Um, in almost all the trials, uh, P2Y12 inhibitor rather than aspirin was a monotherapy of choice after a short DAP duration. Um, but I think what's all missing from this picture and the purpose of this uh, trial is that, you know, all of the prior trials included at least one to three months of DAP before switching to a P2Y12 inhibitor monotherapy. Up until now, there has been no trial done to see whether direct P2Y12 inhibitor monotherapy 
right after the PCI was feasible and safe. So, uh, you know, this is a pilot study. So it's just a single arm to test for feasibility and safety of direct P2Y12 inhibitor monotherapy. And the author evaluated the safety of ticagalor or prasigrel monotherapy directly at following PCI. Um, importantly, uh, the inclusion criteria were NSTEMIs or unstable angina. Um, and these are basically patients who are traditionally felt to benefit from longer DAP therapy uh, simply because they are deemed at higher risk for future ischemic events. Um, so the exclusion criteria were patients who are on chronic oral anticoagulation, patients who have STEMI, and those who require complex PCI. Um, we're not quite ready at the level of STEMI and complex PCI yet. You know, hopefully, um, you know, as we become more and more comfortable with short DAP duration, you know, these uh, kind of upfront monotherapy on, on, on STEMI patients and complex PCI will, will, will you know, come to fruition. Um, so since this is a pilot study, um, there were safety mechanism in place. Um, patients did have platelet function testing before PCI. Um, the first 35 patients underwent OCT after PCI. And importantly, if greater than two or more cases of stent thrombosis incurred in the arm, then basically the trial is canceled and everybody else who was already enrolled would be converted to DAP therapy. So that's the kind of main safety mechanism in place. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, 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 the kind of the design of the trial, 75 patients were selected in the intention to treat analysis. Only a small number, five patients were already being treated with DAPT, uh, had suboptimal stent result, and one had um, inadequate inhibition of platelet activity. But nonetheless, because this is intention to treat analysis, they included those five patients. Um, so all patients receive a loading dose of ticagalor or prasigrel. After PCI, patient continued to receive maintenance dose of ticagalor or prasigrel. And in the case of multiple lesion, it was left at the discretion of the uh, interventional cardiologist to decide whether or not they want to do a stage approach or directly stent the other lesions. Um, the primary endpoints were ischemic and bleeding events. And this was an intention to treat analysis, like I mentioned. So in terms of baseline demographics, 85% um, presented with NSTEMI and 15% presented with unstable angina. The mean age was 64, 29% were female, 24% uh, had diabetes, 28% uh, active smoker, 16% had prior PCIs, and the median hospital stay was three days. So, you know, overall, I think this baseline character is pretty representative of what we see from day to day. Um, so in terms of procedural characteristic, and this is important of note, you know, 98% of patients underwent PCI via radio access, uh, which arguably, you know, improves the bleeding outcome in general uh, versus, you know, femoral access. Um, importantly, at one, three, and six months in clinical practice, you know, there were some drop-offs in the P2Y12 inhibitor kind of monotherapy compliance. Um, so it does reflect, you know, real world scenarios. Um, and then in terms of the outcomes, um, so the yellow box on the left is primary ischemic endpoint, and then the uh, side on the right is bleeding endpoint. So, you know, in general, a small minority of patients, you know, had any complications from monotherapy. Um, so, you know, three patients had met the primary ischemic endpoint, two of them had type 4A MI, and one of them was a type 2 myocardial infarction due to uh, uh, to, to troponin leak from severe hypertension. Uh, and in terms of bleeding outcome, uh, this occurred in seven patients. Two had major bleeding and five had minor bleeding. Uh, of note, the author stated that there were no cases of set thrombosis or spontaneous MI that occurred within, you know, six months of the procedure. So overall, the authors concluded that P2Y12 inhibitor monotherapy directly after PCI for ACS is feasible and not really associated with overt safety concern. Um, so, uh, you know, the feasibility of this trial will hopefully lead to more randomized trials, testing the efficacy of direct P2Y12 inhibitor after PCI compared to short-term DAP. And then from a practical standpoint, you know, this pilot study was 
very carefully controlled from a quality standpoint. So that's really important to take a note of. Uh, for example, I mentioned the 96% radio access. Um, some patients had OCT guided PCI. Uh, and all of those kind of are in place first for kind of the safety of the patient and also, you know, kind of does prop up the uh, a little bit of the uh, um, feasibility aspect of the study as well. And, uh, you know, turns more favorably towards using um, P2Y12 inhibitor model therapy. So in general, you know, more real world study are needed uh, to improve uh, the generalizability of the study as we strive to improve the safety outcomes of coronary interventions. So acknowledgement, I'd like to thank Dr. Fow and Dr. Ahmad for looking over my slides and giving some valuable advice. And I'd like to turn the podium over to uh, Dr. Shaw. I'm gonna defer the discussion to until the end of the session. Uh, so, I'm, so that we can keep going, one second. Is the, are your slides pulled up? Let's see. Can folks still see the slide? Oh. Okay, perfect. Uh, so our next presenter is Dr. Kreena Shah. Uh, Kreena went to college and uh, medical school at Dartmouth and then completed a residency training at Mani Fury Medical Center. After finishing up her cardiology in the next few weeks, uh, she's uh, going to be an EP fellow at NYU. And so she's going to present to us updates from the recently concluded HRS. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, I'm really glad uh, Rohan mentioned that we were uh, be began at, in the COVID era because I didn't know where Fitkin Auditorium was this morning. I followed Dr. Sinousis here. Um, so thank you for this opportunity to check this place out. <laughs> um, uh, yes, I will try to move closer. Okay. So um, I'm going to uh, kind of piggyback off of Kidong and present um, hi uh, a few trials and highlights from HRS, um, no disclosures. So the big story of the weekend um, at HRS was conduction system pacing. There were two late breaking trials looking at this. And then I also wanna quickly review the subsequently released HRS guidelines for cardiac physiologic pacing. Um, so first a little background. As we know, right ventricular pacing and left bundle branch block creates electrical electromechanical dyssynchrony that can have negative outcomes, including pacing-induced cardiomyopathy. Thus, traditional cardiac resynchronization therapy with biventricular pacing has been used and is well-established in improving ejection fraction, heart failure symptoms, and preventing cardiomyopathy in patients with fre expected frequent ventricular pacing needs. Um, more recently, conduction system pacing um, or pacing in the his per Kinji conduction system has been shown to be feasible and provides an alternative to allow for synchronized ventricular activation. While his bundle pacing was the initial target, left bundle branch area pacing has emerged as, a, as more promising with lower and stable capture thresholds, better R wave sensing, and easier implantation. However, while there's a large body of evidence, including large RCTs for biventricular pacing, showing improved clinical outcomes, including survival, heart failure hospitalizations, and echo parameters, we don't have such high quality data for conduction system pacing. Um, the existing data um, includes small RCTs comprising of only about 40 to 50 patients each, and even observational studies um, have had relatively smaller cohorts. Um, so in this setting, two studies were presented at HRS to progress our knowledge in this area. The first trial is left bundle branch area pacing compared to biventricular pacing in patients requiring cardiac resynchronization therapy. The objective of this study was to compare the clinical outcomes between biventricular pacing and left bundle branch area pacing among patients undergoing CRT. They did a non-randomized retrospective multi-center case cohort study investigating patients in whom CRT was achieved using left bundle branch area pacing or biventricular pacing at 15 international centers. 
The choice of CRT was at the discretion of the operator and the institute. The patients they included were adults with an EF of less than or equal to 35% with NYHA class two to four heart failure symptoms um, who had class one or two indications for CRT, underwent successful implant, and had follow-up for at least six months. They excluded those who had pre-existing CRTs or um, had an unsuccessful implant. Primary outcomes that they looked at was a composite of all-cause mortality and heart failure hospitalization, looking at each individual endpoint as secondary outcomes. They also did a subgroup analysis of those patients that had left bundle branch block at baseline. So um, 1,778 patients were identified across the 15 centers um, who met the inclusion criteria. 981 received traditional biventricular pacemakers and 797 received left bundle branch area pacing. The baseline characteristics of the two groups showed patients with an average age of about 70, 30 to 35% female, mean NYHA functional class of about 2.7 and a little over half with left bundle branch block. Medication use, particularly um, heart failure GDMT was similar across the two groups. For the subgroup analysis, there were 1,073 patients with left bundle branch block, um, 626 with biventricular pacer, and 447 with left bundle branch area pacer, and the characteristics were um, pretty similar to the overall group. Um, there were a few notable differences in procedural characteristics between the two groups. So. Um, Procedural duration was longer in, in the left bundle branch area pacing group with similar fluoroscopy times. Pacing threshold uh, was significantly lower in the left bundle branch area pacing group. Um, also incidence of threshold increase by greater than one volt was observed left, uh, less often in the left bundle branch area pacing group um, and more often in the biventricular pacing group. Um, case cure restoration was significantly narrower in the left bundle branch area pacing group, and procedural complications were also significantly lower in the left bundle branch area pacing group, driven predominantly by lower rate of pericardial effusions, lead dislodgement, and infection. Um, so on multivariate analysis, the primary outcome of death or heart failure hospitalization was significantly lower in the left bundle branch area pacing group at 21% compared with 28% in the biventricular pacing group uh, for a hazard ratio of 1.5. Um, the findings were similar when looking at the uh, subgroup with left bundle branch block at baseline. Um, secondary outcomes showed lower mortality in the left bundle branch area pacing group, but did not reach statistical significance. The incidence of heart failure hospitalizations was significantly re reduced as well in the left bundle branch area pacing group. Um, in terms of other endpoints, left bundle branch area pacing was associated with greater reduction in QR restoration, as well as greater improvements in functional class compared with five ventricular pacing. And then echo parameters were also promising. In both groups, EF significantly improved from baseline um, in all patients and in the left bundle branch block subgroup. Um, notably, the improvement in EF was greater in the left bundle branch area pacing group compared with the biventricular pacing group. Additionally, um, echo response, uh, which was defined as EF increase of at least 5%, um, or hyper response defined by an improvement in 20% um, or complete recovery of EF, was greater in the left bundle branch area pacing group compared with biventricular pacing. Um, in summary, left bundle branch area pacing was associated with significant reduction in the primary composite endpoint of all-cause mortality and heart failure hospitalizations compared to biventricular pacing, and secondary outcomes showed reduced heart failure hospitalizations, greater QRS narrowing, greater improvement in functional class, and larger improvement in echographic parameters in the left bundle branch area pacing group. I tell Ms. back and I say that what's up. Okay. All right, and this is an official one. This is an official one. Yeah, it's okay. in the chart.
mean, I'm not able to move. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Okay, the major limitations of these findings, of course, that is that this was a non-randomized retrospective cohort, cohort um, analyzed according to treatment, allowing for selection and population bias. Um, I'll go over some more conclusions later, but before doing so, um, I wanna discuss the other study that was also presented at HRS. Um, this was his per Kinji conduction system pacing optimized trial of cardiac resynchronization therapy versus biventricular pacing um, notably a randomized control trial. So the aim here was to compare the feasibility and clinical efficacy of his optimized conduction system pacing guided CRT, aka hot CRT, um, which is much easier to say than left bundle branch area pacing a million times over. So I appreciate that. <laughs> um, compare it with biventricular pacing in patients with heart failure, reduced EF, and indication for CRT. Um, we'll talk about what hot CRT means in a few slides. Um, this was a prospective randomized single-blinded pilot study done at three hospitals in the Geisinger Health System in Pennsylvania. Um, there was one-to-one -one randomization stratified by baseline presence of left bundle branch block and clinical site. Um, here they included adults with symptomatic heart failure and any class one or 2A indications for CRT. These are patients with EF less than or equal to 35% with either a left bundle branch block and QRS greater than 120 milliseconds or a non-left bundle branch block wide QRS greater than 150 milliseconds. These are also patients with a mid-range EF and need for greater than 40% RV pacing or existing pacing induced cardiomyopathies. Patients with pre-existing CRT or prior failed attempt at CRT were excluded. Um, for the hot CRT arm, there were specific guidelines on how to choose and optimize the pacing. Uh, patients with a narrow QRS at baseline were first trialed with a HIS bundle lead. Um, if the threshold was high, though, this was moved uh, to the left bundle branch area. For patients with a wide QRS, um, they were initially trialed with a left bundle branch area um, pacing site. But if there was no left bundle branch capture or the stim to peak time was long um, and thus uh, they had a wide QRS, this was combined with a CS lead to achieve maximal electrical resynchronization. Um, biventricular pacing was done with the traditional CS lead with placement targeted in the posterior lateral or lateral CS using adaptive LV pacing algorithms. Um, the primary outcome in this pilot study was a change in EF at six months. They, additionally, they looked at safety endpoint of freedom from major complication, which was defined as cardiac tamponade, stroke, infection requiring explant, and lead revision. Other secondary endpoints were also measured, as you can see here, and they also did a subgroup analysis of patients with left bundle branch block at baseline. Um, 102 patients were initially randomized, um, though two were excluded after not meeting inclusion criteria. Um, 50 patients were randomized to the biventricular pacing group, of which 41 had successful implant, um, thus an 82% success rate. The other nine patients um, with failure in implant were crossed over to the hot CRT arm. Um, and then 50 patients were randomized to hot CRT and implant was successful in 48 of those patients for 96% success rate. The other two patients crossed over to the biventricular pacing arm and patients were analyzed as intention to treat. Um, for the results, the baseline characteristics of the patients were generally similar across the two groups, um, with an average age of about 70, 60% um, non-ischemic patients, left bundle branch block in uh, about 60% of patients, um, mean cure restoration 165 milliseconds, mean EF about 30%, and average NYHA class 2.5 at baseline. Medication use was also similar, although ACE, ARB, ARNI use was lower in the biventricular pacing arm, only 64% compared with 88% in the hot TRT group. Um, the procedural characteristics, as seen earlier, the success rate was significantly higher in the hot CRT group. Um, procedural times are similar in both groups, and notably in the hot CRT group, um, four got a his bundle lead, 39 a left bundle area, sorry, left bundle branch area lead, and five had the additional CS lead. So the group predominantly received left bundle branch area pacing. Um, pacing thresholds were significantly lower in the hot CRT group as well compared with biventricular pacing. For the primary endpoint of change in EF, both groups showed 
increased EF from baseline with a 12% increase in the hot CRT group and an 8% increase in the biventricular pacing group. This met statistical significance. Um, this, there was no significant difference in the number of patients who had a greater than 5% response, however. Um, there was also no significant difference in the primary safety endpoint um, or the composite secondary endpoint of clinical events. And again, this is the change from baseline at six months of EF. Um, and then here you can see the secondary endpoints of cure restoration, um, LV and systolic volume and quality of life, um, which all improved significantly at six months um, from baseline in both groups, but there was no significant difference between the two groups. Looking more at the complications, total complications were actually greater in the biventricular pacing group, driven predominantly by lead threshold increase and persistent phrenic nerve stimulation, which could not be corrected despite uh, multiple programming attempts. Um, so in summary, hot CRT was associated with improvement in EF at six months, more so um, than the biventricular pacing group. Additionally, it shortened the QRS and reduced um, LV and systolic volume similarly to biventricular pacing. It also had similar major complication rate, which was overall low, and notably it had lower implant failure rate compared to biventricular pacing um, with only 4% crossover compared with 18%. The major limitation of the study was its small size as a pilot study underpowered um, to look at important clinical outcomes. Um, there was limited follow-up and the population was narrow, predominantly Caucasian males uh, um, in a, a rural site. So putting both studies together, we have one retrospective cohort of 1,778 patients needing CRT who had significant reduction in all-cause mortality and heart failure hospitalizations with left bundle branch area pacing compared with biventricular pacing. And we have one randomized control trial of 100 patients requiring CRT who had greater improvement in EF using hot CRT, 78% um, of which was by left bundle branch area pacing alone um, compared with biventricular pacing at six months. So with this information, the Heart Rhythm Society released new guidelines last week for the use of cardiac physiologic pacing for the avoidance and mitigation of heart failure. Um, they stated, and I could not really say it any better myself, the strength of evidence for CRT and heart failure is substantially greater than what is available to support conduction system pacing. Multiple randomized control trials have shown a beneficial effect of CRT in reducing heart failure symptoms and hospitalization, improving LV function, and increasing survival. The majority of data on conduction system pacing are observational, and long-term data on lead survival are lacking. Ongoing and planned studies are likely to provide future guidance on the use of conduction system pacing compared to CRT. CRT remains recommended for patients with heart failure, EF less than or equal to 35%, left bundle branch block, QRS duration greater than or equal to 150 milliseconds, and NYHA class two to four symptoms on GDMT. However, the new guidelines do support conduction system pacing in certain patients. Um, for example, these include when effective CRT cannot be achieved with biventricular pacing, um, or also this include they include 2B recommendations for patients with EF 36 to 50% um, left bundle branch block and a wide QRS greater than 150 milliseconds or patients with EF less than third or equal to 35% non-left bundle branch block um, for QRS greater than 120 milliseconds. Um, and I suspect that recommendation comes to the, um, the less uh, strength of the data for CRT in those patients. Additionally, for patients who need pacemaker and will require substantive ventricular pacing defined as greater than 20 to 40%, there is a 2A recommendation for conduction system pacing if EF is 36 to 50% and 2B if EF is um, greater than 50%. Uh, so conduction system pacing overall, while not yet evaluated in large trials, has shown a lot of promise in these small early trials. Physiologically, it provides similar electrical synchronous ventricular activation as traditional biventricular pacing. And thus, while these larger trials are absolutely needed and coming, um, there's no reason to believe it will not have a similar clinical effect. Um, so moving on, um, 
I had two more trials, but I think I'll just get through one more. Um, so the next one uh, trial is presenting a new investigational device, a dual chamber leadless cardiac pacemaker system with bi-directional communication for AV synchrony. Um, this was presented at HRS and also simultaneously published in the New England Journal of Medicine on the same day. So um, as background, we know that traditional transvenous pacer, pacemaker complications affect up to one in six patients at three-year follow-up. And these complications are overwhelmingly related to the leads or the pocket, including hematomas, infections, lead insertion problems like pneumothoraxes, vascular obstruction, and reduced vascular access. The leadless pacemaker system has neither lead nor pocket, and thus has been associated with fewer long-term complications. Studies have shown 38% fewer system reinterventions and 31% fewer chronic complications. Um, however, current available leadless technologies are limited to single chamber application and cannot provide atrial pacing or fully support AV synchrony. Um, so the Avir DR system by Abbott involves two independently implanted cardiac devices into the right atrium and the right ventricle respectively, like you can see here. Um, there are slight differences between the two devices in terms of form factor to accommodate the right atrium. Um, the right atrial appendage, oh, sorry, the right atrial device is typically implanted into the base of the right atrial appendage, and the right ventricular device is implanted into the RV septum. Um, here you can see the chest x-rays with um, positioning of the implanted devices. Um, importantly, there's an I2I communication technology incorporated, which allows for bi-directional beat-to-beat wireless communication between the atrial and ventricular device to fully facilitate all modalities of dual chamber pacing. So the objective of the study was just to assess the safety and performance of the system. Um, and they did it uh, with a pro prospective multi-center non-randomized study evaluating patients with standard indications for dual chamber pacing. Um, they enrolled 550 and they presented um, the first 300 um, evaluated for safety and efficacy here. Um, broad inclusion criteria, again, including any adult that had guidelines-based indication for dual chamber pacing with life expectancy of at least a year um, exclusion criteria uh, were notable for the presence of IVC filter, mechanical tricuspid valve, um, pre-existing endocardial pacing or defibrillator leads, although lead fragments were okay for patients who had undergone extraction, um, ICD or CRT, and the presence of a non avir leadless pacemaker. Um, the primary endpoints were safety and efficacy endpoints, so safety was measured as freedom from device or procedure-related complications through 90 days after implantation. The first efficacy endpoint looked at atrial electrical endpoints, as this was the first time this atrial device was used. Um, the RV leadless device has already previously met performance goals. And the second efficacy endpoint looked at the success of AV synchrony um, at a three-month visit. This was designed, uh, defined as paced or sense ventricular beat within 300 milliseconds of the atrial paced or sense beat in at least 70% of um, cardiac cycles. Um, these were the performance goals uh, based on published data for transvenous pacemaker complications and prior studies of single chamber leadless pacemakers. Um, of the first 300 patients, two only received a ventricular lead and three died before the three month visit. So um, all 300 were analyzed for the safety endpoint, 299 for the first efficacy point and 294 for the second. Uh, the patients were a mean age of about uh, 69, 38% female, had a BMI ranging from 15 to 50. Um, two thirds had sinus node dysfunction and the re remaining had complete heart block. Uh, nearly 10% had undergone or had concomitant extraction of a prior pacing system. Um, just briefly, the overall success rate of the procedure was 98.3%. Um, skip the rest of this. And then looking at the primary safety endpoint, there was a 90% rate of freedom from any complication at three months, um, which met the pre-specified performance goal. Of the complications, the most common um, was presence of cardiac arrhythmia, most often AFib um, three, in 3.3% of patients. There was a 1.7% intraprocedural dislodgement rate and a notable 1.7% post-procedural dislodgement rate 
um, all of which were managed percutaneously. Um, the dislodgements were predominantly of the atrial device and were noted to be early in procedural experience, which later improved after focusing on the right atrial appendage base for implant. Um, in terms of the efficacy endpoints, 90% um, met the first endpoint of atrial electrical um, uh, capture and sensing. For AV synchrony, um, the overall success rate was 97%. Um, and just to show, AV synchrony was actually measured in multiple positions. So you can see while um, there was not just robust AV synchrony while kind of sitting and lying down, but also standing, walking, and walking fast. Um, so in summary, the Avira DR system was successfully implanted in 98% of patients requiring dual chamber pacing um, with three months safety and efficacy endpoints meeting performance goals. Importantly, there was reliable beat-to-beat -beat wireless bidirectional communication in 97% of patients. Um, this can expand the use cases of leadless pacemakers to include atrial only or fully dual chamber pacing. The limitations are um, obviously this is just a single arm study evaluating the safety of this device um, for expanded use. Um, there would need to be comparator studies, ideally randomized. Um, and even with regard to safety, we do need longer term data. Um, the post procedural dislodgement rate is high. And um, while it seems to be related to the early learning curve of implanting a new device, we would need to ensure that this is not a continued problem. Um, and then finally, with regard to the AV synchrony, um, this was extremely promising, but only measured in a controlled clinic environment. So um, we would want to see better real world data before moving forward with this device. Um, and I think I will end there um, with just a thank you to Dr. Freeman, who I think had to step up. First of all, thank you for summarizing those, those studies, and um, I, I think we caught up pretty quickly um, uh, due to your efforts. Um, maybe a question for Kidong. Um, as it relates to intracoronary physiology and expectations that we are moving into a new era um, uh, of, of uh, invasive um, you know, um, assessment before intervention, how, do, how does that affect your inter interpretation provisional versus the, uh, the two-stent strategy? And, and how often was that used to evaluate um, the, the downstream is potential ischemic burden of those territories before the implants were placed? So um, I think from my kind of own personal experience, um, I think invasive measurement is sometimes challenging in these uh, bifurcation lesions because you know, it really depends on kind of the proximity of the uh, lesions in the side branch and the distal branch and how close or far away apart they are and what the burden is. Um, so sometimes, oftentimes, it's hard to kind of uh, measure the uh, FFR or IFR of uh, these lesions if they're kind of pretty sequential to one another. Um, but I think, you know, there's always a rule for, um, uh, you know, invasive physiologic studies. And I think a lot of times they are done on side branches um, and kind of dictates whether or not, you know, lesion should be uh, stented or not. Um, overall, you know, off the top of my head, I don't know if uh, studies have specifically looked at invasive testing for uh, determining whether or not, you know, one should do provisional or two stent strategies. Um, but, um, you know, in the trials that I presented, um, you know, a lot of those uh, side branches are kind of selected in a sense that they have to be greater than a certain diameter. They have to be greater than five millimeters in life. And so that's kind of more or less an angiographic selection um, uh, in terms of the kind of, you know, stenting strategy. Um, you know, that's kind of the rationale why they, you know, chose those kind of criteria for side branch. Um, uh, but uh, maybe, you know, some, other, you know, more seasoned internationalists will be better able to talk about what their day-to-day uh, -day practice is like. Yeah. And Karina, quickly, um, as it relates, you know, there was a, a lot uh, done a decade past um, in, as CRT developed um, in looking at echocardiographic parameters of the synchrony and its resolution. 
Can you speak to what we've learned so far from, from the studies you presented as relates to those types of parameters? Were they evaluated? Are they necessary? And do you feel like they're, they're going to be incorporated into the future randomized trials that I suspect are coming down the pipe? Um, so uh, I think uh, a lot of what we've learned, at least my understanding from the echocardiographic parameters of dyssynchrony um, and kind of why um, CRT didn't work as well in non-left bundle branch block patients um, was how that dyssynchrony exists within the left ventricle. Um, and I think uh, while the studies will obviously should obviously look into um, like the activation pattern of the left ventricle. I think what's really promising to me is how good the EKGs look, um, which I don't think we can always say for biventricular pacing. And I think that's kind of a simplified way to think about it. But I think if you really are um, getting very narrow uh, ventricular activation, you probably are getting very synchronous activation of the LV. Um, and so, uh, so I think that's kind of what I meant by the um, physiology matches what we're trying to do with my bi biventricular pacing. And I think often we're able to do it better um, because in, especially in patients with a left bundle branch block, we're able to bypass the block and kind of just use their native conduction system as opposed to having two leads that are timed um, to be simultaneous. 